So today we are hosting our second webinar in our series on AI and the built environments. I am Christophe Lelanou, a board member of the Franco-British Data Society. Our speaker for today's webinar will be introduced uh, by Pierre Sonal, an architect and co-founder of ERC Digital. AI, AI, sorry. AI is currently transforming the architecture sector, and I'm thrilled to explore this topic further through our series of webinars. In our previous webinar, the first one of the series, we discussed creativity and how architects are leveraging AI in their daily work. If you miss it, you can find the recording on our YouTube channel. Anne will share all the link on our chat as well and later with you as well. And our next and uh, third and final webinar of this series will be in two weeks on May 29th. It's a Wednesday as well at the same time, focusing on the impact on AI on software developments. <clears throat> and today's webinar is focusing on Open Beam. But before giving the floor to Pierre to introduce the speaker, I would like to give a brief introduction to the Franco-British Data Society. So the society is a new society with the goal of promoting education on digital and data related topics and providing a networking platform. <clears throat> we hope to become soon an educational charity. We welcome in our society a diverse mix of entrepreneurs, experts, practitioners and non-expert people interested in data and digital topics. We like to explore discussion from a Franco-British and European perspective covering policy, governance, digital transformation, artificial intelligence, data science, education, and so on. If you are interested in our event, you can follow us on LinkedIn or you can subscribe to our newsletter. Anne as well will share all the links on the, on the chat. Some of our events like today are advertised online and free to attend, while others are more private and open only to our members. So if you like to support us as well, you can become a member of the society. <clears throat> and if you have any question on this, please don't hesitate to reach out for any more information. So finally, I would like to thank our corporate sponsor, Data Learning and Erwin Mitchell, without whom it would not be possible to organize this webinar today. So Pierre, you would like to introduce uh, our speaker for today, Jane? Yes, th th thank you very much, Christophe. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be to be there and to see so many of you here for a topic which is very important uh, to us. Uh, Jaime and I are just back from uh, Saudi Arabia. We landed this morning at half five after two days of a summit where we presented as OpenBeam uh, consultant the work we did on, on phase one of one of the projects uh, there. And so we spent the last two days uh, in Saudi Arabia talking about Open Beam, the importance of Open Beam. And uh, today we want to sort of extend that topic and to see how uh, AI will fit within Open Beam, within the current framework. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Jaime, who is uh, the co founder with myself of. Uh, Arc World and although Arc Digital, which is our uh, Open Beam consultancy. So uh, Jaime is an architect by training. Uh, he's been using Archicad uh, as the main authoring tool for more than 20 years, uh, to the point that he can as well code the language that Archicad speaks, which is the GDL coding. And he has a vast experience in Open Beam and interoperability between softwares. Uh, and we will today extend that aspect of Open Beam, so the interoperability, to AI and to see how it can enhance the way uh, we work and we deliver the built environment. So without further ado, uh, Jaime, the floor is yours. Thank you for being there with us. Thank you, Pierre, for the introduction. Um, I hope you can, everybody, uh, hear me. Going to to start the presentation now. Um, as Pierre mentioned, we are uh, Art World. Um, we are a, a group of, of companies and, and um, different brands that we use to, to provide services in the built environment. Um, we have Art Design, uh, which 
um, which um, enables us to provide architectural services, uh, and that complements our consultancy services and BIM management that we provide with our digital. Uh, which retrofit each other. Um, the result of this uh, collaboration uh, generally leads to, to tools or, or automations that um, we first te test internally and then we, we commercialize in our market uh, for other architects and, and, and designers to, to be able to use these tools. And we also have a branch for, for uh, training and education called ARC Academy. Today we are going to introduce uh, the di di digitalization um, in the AC sector and to give a bit of a framework of, of how we arrived to the current situation, um, we are going to review a, a few of the, of the stages that uh, this digital transformation has been taken in the, in the latest years. So the first um, production method that we used to have in the AC industry was, was analog methods. Um, this was very labor intensive and skill intensive, so you needed to be a good draftman uh, to be able to, to uh, develop uh, architectural drawings. And it, it was just not, not just the technical uh, formation, but also to be able to, to actually draw by hand, which is something that not everybody is skilled at. Um, also, being paper-based and analog-based, the coordination between disciplines was quite difficult and often not very, very profound. Um, with the introduction of personal computers and the, the first CAD applications, uh, we started to, to transition to digital pro production methods, which of course require less labor. Uh, people working in the industry became more efficient and also less skilled people in the sense that you didn't, you didn't, you didn't need to have a good uh, hand drawing skills. You just uh, needed to be able to, to learn a particular software and the software was replicating what, what, what we used to do by hand, um, but without knowing generally um, what was the context. Uh, for example, in CAD, a line represents a line and this can be anything uh, that you want to represent with a line. Uh, two parallel lines can be a, a wall, but also can be part of a detail of a screw or simply simply um, uh, uh, design that you are starting to sketch. But the program doesn't have a context of what you are trying to represent with that. Um, of course, this uh, enabled better to the coordination uh, because we could overlay uh, drawings received from consultants, for example. So this enable a, a bit better collaboration. The third evolution was uh, to introduce parametric CAD um, with the idea of um, uh, automation in this uh, drafting process, as well as intelligent objects to a certain extent that could adapt to different dimensions or, or to different layouts. And um, of course, um, as well, the 3D uh, modeling started to, to be part of the CAD uh, workflow. Although uh, still the, the software do, didn't know uh, what's the context of what, of what you are trying to represent, didn't have information about the, the, the 3D model as a virtual representation of the building. This is where we arrive to building information modeling, um, which is the current state. Um, this is based on parametric design. And as you can see in the image above uh, from Graphisoft, uh, showcasing uh, the concept of BIM. The idea is that we have a central uh, model that is not only geometry, but also contains data and is object oriented. So uh, the software has a, a context of uh, when you are drawing a wall, it, it is aware that it has certain uh, layers, it has a certain height, and uh, a wall can contain windows, a wall can contain doors. Um, and that is uh, different to another object, which can be a roof or a column or a, a slab. And this uh, rich model then produces the rest of the documentation required uh, for the project or any other output. It can be 2D drawings, it can be uh, plans, elevation sections, could be animations, uh, virtual reality, uh, cost uh, uh, extraction, uh, analysis uh, of, the, of the different components. So it's, it's a much more information driven approach. And of course, uh, enables uh, as well the coordination between several disciplines, because uh, instead of sharing drawings that is very difficult to compare to each other, we are sharing a 3D model that we can run class detections and visually inspect that they are coordinated and even do uh, comments for the other disciplines to take this comment on, on their own model. 
The next step um, we think is going towards uh, artificial intelligence design. So basically trying to add more um, complexity to the to the computing um, engine that is helping uh, the designer in a much more uh, interactive way that is uh, allowed by the by the current trends of artificial intelligence and the and the power that they are able to to process uh, information. Um, also, we are evolving to automatic automated construction methods. So soon the, the BIM model won't, won't be just a representation that then will, will have to be interpreted on site, but it will be a direct uh, translation from the model to the site by uh, robots either printing 3D walls or uh, automated processes in manufacturing that then produce the components that will uh, conform the, the architectural design in the end, but all machine driven and out automated. And, and this also connects to what the concept of digital twins, uh, Internet of Things and the metaverse. Um, basically, we uh, will be able to have a real time performance of the buildings that we design on operation and all this information um, captured by sensors could be repli replicated in what it, it will become a, a digital twin, which um logically will be an evolution of that beam model that was used during the design process and that can uh, be a, a digital representation of the built asset and uh, represent a 3d model uh, database of the uh, sensors that are providing data uh, during occupation this is an example of uh, how complex uh, the current um, environment of the build, uh, building life cycle is. Uh, we have a lot of different operations, different stakeholders involved in the process of uh, designing a building um, from the beginning to uh, with, uh, along with the client needs uh, to construction, to uh, use end of life uh, and, and recycling of, of, of the buildings. Um, so this concept of circularity, um, we think is also quite uh, fundamental um, both uh, with uh, the concept of BIM, having, having a model that you can um, use as a database of uh, what materials are contained in a particular building. And if this becomes um, a common database, then this could allow really a, a revolution in the way that we build and we um, recycle um, the built environment. In this context, um, BIM is already changing the way we are designing buildings. Um, the traditional workflow uh, meant that a lot of the uh, design effort was done just before uh, manufacturing and construction. So little effort was uh, done in coordinating during the uh, early stages of the project. And with BIM, uh, we tend to try to bring all that effort to the, um, to the start of the process. Um, and bring as much information in the model as possible in the early design stages. So when we get to the uh, construction stage, most of the issues have been foreseen in the virtual model and have been resolved because before getting to site, which is uh, where the changes or variations are more, more expensive to, to realize. Um, in this regard, uh, the collaborative de uh, design process is, is very important and um, as much as possible, the, the stakeholders uh, relevant to the decisions uh, that need to be made for the final design um, are encouraged to be brought uh, to the beginning of the process. So we think that people are central to open beam and not, not just uh, technology. In that context, there is a international uh, ISO standard and ISO 9650, um, which is uh, dealing exactly um, about these matters, how to share information in the um, BIM uh, environment and how this um, collaboration should take place in, a, in the most efficient man manner. Um, it, it is based on previous British standards um, that uh, started in 2007, but uh, have been, uh, has uh, been um, embraced by a lot of different countries. Uh, for example, in France, it's compulsory already uh, to produce uh, building information models for any public project um, that is um, above a certain size. 
Uh, in England happens the same. Um, in Spain, they are just starting to implement this uh, this year. Uh, with um, they aim to have this ready for 2030. But in general, um, every country is realizing that uh, building information modeling and digitalization in the building environment is fundamental to be more efficient in the way we produce, um, share, and archive information and access this information afterwards. Um, Quite central to this idea of collaboration and, and sharing uh, information is the use of open data formats. Um, independent from the source, uh, source platform that uh, we use to, uh, to produce it. Uh, for example, in, for images, we have, we have JPEG, uh, that is an open data format, or for documentation and, and text, we have PDF uh, that can combine with images. And the equivalent to to these open data formats in the uh, BIM um, um, context is uh, IFC, Industry Foundation Classes, which is an open uh, 3D geometry format that also holds all the data um, related to the, to the geometry. So for us, the definition of open BIM uh, is the freedom that every designer should have to choose whatever platform or whatever software that is uh, best um, for their particular needs. Um, there are really um, a multitude of softwares that are currently used in the AC industry, and um, this graphic uh, exemplifies that. And of course, there are there are breaches between them. Uh, sometimes uh, this is uh, in the form of an API that provides a direct connection, or sometimes it's intermediate data formats that are compatible between each other. But uh, we believe in the idea uh, of ISO, ISO 9650 that we shouldn't share information using proprietary formats because then it's locked to a certain manufacturer or a certain uh, copyright of the producer of, of that particular software. And uh, therefore, we, we believe that IFC is central to this sharing of information in an open way and also to be able to access this information in the future, regardless of, of the software uh, version or platform. Um, this is an example of how um, currently parametric design is helping uh, with the automation of a lot of uh, the tasks that used to be manual in the design process. Um, as an example of the before graphic, this is a connection between Rhinoceros, which is a, a modeling software, and Grasshopper, which is a visual scripting software that you can generate uh, geometry by uh, connecting nodes um, into different operations, and then the translation, which is uh, automatic, into the BIM model uh, in ARCHICAD. So we are connecting three different softwares, and of course, the introduction of AI in all these processes will help uh, to make this more efficient. Uh, in the same sense, the, the 3D models and the BIM models that we produce during the, the design process um, can be used to simulate uh, real-world uh, conditions. In this case, for example, uh, irradiation on a facade of a building um, regarding a particular location, shadow analysis uh, during the, a particular date uh, in the year and that particular location of the building. Um, this is an example of this uh, kind of analysis done in, in Archicad in different floors of a, of a building that we are currently constructing in, in London. And the, the, the thing is that a lot of this currently depends on what um, capabilities the software has implemented. But we believe um, AI will help in, in driving this uh, kind of uh, environmental analysis and make it, it more accessible for the users in a, in a much more uh, automated way, because um, the way it is now, you have to have quite a specialized knowledge to be able to produce this information. Um, this is another example. Uh, this is Eco Designer in the so design software that we use, Archicad. And uh, we are seeing here different kinds of uh, elements in the building that are being analyzed for their energy performance. And because uh, the model contains all, all the data, for example, of a particular wall in this case, we can calculate the U-value um, according to the real material uh, thermal performance and therefore um, foresee if we are complying with the regulation. Uh, in a similar way, we can do analysis of thermal bridges and um, feed this information into the energy model. Uh, 
all this is currently uh, manual and a, a lot of steps to uh, get to the final result. So we think AI um, will help in, in putting all this together. Um, this is another example of how currently AI is being introduced in uh, a lot of the design software that uh, are um, being used in the industry. Um, this is Midjourney. Uh, it's a, um, a, a, a image generating um, uh, environment that using a prompt, you can describe what you want to achieve and it's using a very simplified uh, image or concept that you can model uh, in, in the software, and then it will process that image and produce a, a, a result interpreting uh, the, the prompt and the geometry that, that you introduce uh, as a base. Uh, here we can see the different results of different prompts, um, but we find that these uh, kind of images are more for inspiration uh, in the initial concept stage, uh, because uh, by the nature of the of the AI generation of the images, there will be mistakes, and there are things that don't don't look quite right. So we don't see this as a replacement yet for completely uh, uh, user driven uh, renders based on the model, but rather as inspiration. And that's this is how we have been using it in our projects. This is another example of a project that we are developing. This is uh, giving different prompts uh, for graphical styles um, of, of a render of the interior. In this case, a, a more um, a stylistic or, or um, draw, drawn effect um, visualization or a more realistic on the left and, and more photographic. But you can see that the interpretation of, of the initial model can be quite different. So we can see a sky here on the right when that wasn't part of the initial image. We can see a skylights here. So the AI um, not, doesn't always produce the, the result you want. For example, there was a glazed balustrade going through here and it's just uh, removed the central bit. So in a way, it can be used to produce uh, images and inspiration, but we don't think uh, this could be a final render that you give to, to your client. Uh, these are more close to, to a final render, but still there are mistakes. Um, and this is just exploring different ideas for materials, and uh, this is all based in, in an existing model that we are proposing uh, some different options. Um, another way that currently we are using uh, AI um, is to help uh, with coding. As uh, Pierre mentioned, we use uh, GDL scripting in Archica to develop our own tools. And here on the left, you can see um, a code I, I put together, and then I asked uh, ChatGPT to review that code and to see if it uh, works uh, properly. And then uh, Doing that is quite uh, efficient to interpret something that you have put together and, and suggest how it could be uh, developed further. Um, but everything depends of the training or the database that the AI has been provided. So if GDL is not part of ChatGPT in general, the results that you will get if you try to generate code directly uh, are not going to be um, very, very efficient because um, some of the commands, for example, doesn't exist uh, um, in, in that particular interpretation of ChatGPT. Um, another example uh, here on the right is uh, creating a, a regular expression that can drive um, the checking of information of a particular model. There is a, a new standard called information delivery specification that is aiming to provide a machine readable um, and a structured approach to checking information in the models um, that is both uh, in being able to be uh, interpreted by humans, but also easily interpreted by, by machine code. So this is where AI can connect to this kind of information that we are introducing in the model. And we believe that um, using IFC as a standard format for um, feeding, uh, building information to AI is uh, the logical step to, to regularize how AI is um, used in the built environment. Um, we also uh, see the to... emergence of uh, online applications, completely new applications. For example, um, in this case, an urban planning uh, assistant that is um, uh, driven by AI. So you can very quickly assess uh, different options for urban design, for example. 
And uh, a lot of this is driven by code compliance and databases of what uh, the, the building code in that particular area needs to comply. Although we need to mention that the interpretation of the building codes is current, uh, currently the most uh, challenging uh, uh, problem that we are facing integrating AI because they are not written in a way that are easily uh, interpretable by, by the machine uh, learning. And as well, they are usually um, subject to, to different interpretations and uh, is not really systematized the way this information is produced, depending on the location. So um, a, an important step to be able to, to check compliance uh, with AI will be to make the, the, the building codes uh, machine readable in, the, in this Jim, regard. We can you hear me? Yes. It's going to be it's already 27 minutes, so it's going to be time to. to yes, I'm almost shopping. finished. Uh, this is another yes, example. Get a couple um, of questions. An integration um, of AI in in the current design softwares, uh, and basically is automating tasks that the software already is able to perform um, uh, by itself with help with the user. So we also think that uh, the logical integration of AI in the design softwares is to try to, to help the users and not to uh, create uh, new tools uh, from scratch because uh, all needs a, a framework behind to, to be able to work on. And just to, to finish, uh, we think that there is no open BIM with an, an open mind. Uh, so let's embrace open AI as part of, uh, of the BIM journey. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, James. It was uh, very uh, fascinating as well. So we have a couple of questions in the chat, and uh, maybe I can read them as well for you. Uh, yes. First question from Ludovic is wondering if you can comment a bit on your uh, on the cybersecurity policy and the cybersecurity aspect of your operations. Um, well, we tend to to work in in um, in a cloud environment. Uh, we work remotely, so we use our own servers to to develop uh, our designs um, using Archicad, and all the design team can connect uh, to these servers. So um, that's one of the of the strategies that we use uh, because we also are quite mobile and work remotely uh, so this helps uh, a lot with the with the way we work and um, to store our our uh, project information we use uh, google services uh, currently and, and, and our own uh, servers okay uh, and another question as well or maybe two questions maybe i can connect uh, the one the question one on three as well, uh, uh, do you foresee that AI-generated rendering being able to be able to provide exploitable 3D of your environment? Will we be able as well, like you mentioned, I think quickly, uh, uh, yes. metaverse yeah. and alternative world. So do you think this and soon we'll be able to move around this uh, environment you are going to create? Yes, and, uh, uh, definitely. And maybe a connected uh, question is, uh, do you think that this AI will reduce the need for technicians, especially at detailed design? Yes. Uh, well, for the first question, I, th I think we have uh, been seeing the evolution of the uh, AI engines uh, from the first text-based, uh, like ChatGPT, to then Midjourney that was able to produce uh, images, to now Sora that is able to produce videos. And that's why we think uh, the logical step to, to be able to produce 3D model information using AI will be to um, follow the IFC schema. Because, yeah, of course, we could uh, in, in introduce AI in very different design softwares, but then it's always going to produce a, um, the, the geometry and information based on a proprietary closed format that is not going to, to be able to, to easily be shared with others uh, using other platforms. So we, we really believe that the way forward with uh, AI is to use this common uh, format. Um, and uh, regarding the, the replacement of technicians, I don't think AI is here to replace anyone. I think maybe uh, you will be replaced by someone who uses AI best, better than you. Uh, so I think we should uh, understand AI as a tool, and, a, and a, as, a, as, as the computer has been a tool for for designing uh, for many years. AI is a, is the next step. Of course, it's a it's a it's a 
very big leap. But we don't think AI is going to replace anyone. Uh, it's going to be used as, a, as another tool in, in our tool set. OK, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I think we are getting uh, over time now. So Pierre, do you want to have a, a final word maybe or for conclusions today? No, just to say thank you very much. And just saying that there is maybe one last question, which could be the final word for for, for, from Jaime. So Jaime, what is your, it's a question from Benjamin Blasco, what is your opinion on the use of AI to better guesstimate the global price of a building using existing database and analyzing evolution of price curve? Thank you, Benjamin, very interesting question. So the last word is for you, Jaime. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very pertinent question. Uh, in general, I think the, the power of uh, AI is the ability to process large data sets. Uh, and this can be either um, your own specific data sets. A lot of uh, architectural studios or construction companies are, are already training AI in their own uh, data sets to produce results uh, very tailored to, to their needs. Uh, but of course, if uh, this information about pricing is publicly available, for example, in Spain, we have a, a government driven database of uh, official construction prices There is is very easy to connect that to a BIM model that has quantities and has specifications to this database of prices that can be uh, publicly available. So the more data that we feed to AI, the, the better uh, we are going to be able to, to analyze uh, our, our designs and the built environment uh, in general. Michael, as well, I think you had a question as well. You raise your hand. Uh, I think I allow you to to speak. Yes, Michael. No. <clears throat> okay, but then uh, I think but we are maybe going to conclude. Can, can you hear me uh, now, Christoph? Sorry, can so, you announce the, the date of the next webinar? Yes, of course. Uh, the next webinar is on the 29th of May in two weeks, Wednesday, the 29th of May at 12.30 UK time or 1.30 French time. Trying to keep it short to, as well, a bit more, we're yeah. still a, a bit over 30 minutes yeah. uh, during the lunch break, so. And but the last webinar will be with uh, we really lucky to have Mark Neze from Nemechek, who is the chief development officer of the entire Nemechek group, and will provide a lot of insights on how AI is revolutionizing uh, the software development in the ACO industry. And he will touch also on the sustainability aspect and also the ethical use of AI because it's a key subject, how our data is used by people who are training AI. So we're very excited to have this one in, in two weeks. And thank you very much, Jaime, for, for a great presentation as, as always, and Christoph for sharing that meeting perfectly again. Thank you everyone for being there. We look forward to seeing you all in two weeks. I apologize for my voice, but the two days in Saudi Arabia took, took their toll on, on this. Thank you. <clears throat> but thanks a lot Thank everyone, you everyone. Of you as well for coming today.